Boker Tov. Today's daf Yomi is Kisubo's daf Yud Ches, Kisubo's 18, but we're going to start on 17b. We're going to start on 17b, really in the middle of the page, where our Mishnah have been discussing those cases where we, where we say that, that Rebbe Gamil and Rebbe Yeshua argue about whether or not we believe the the woman's claims. Now, when Will says we believe, we believe her because she could have said a better lie. She could have had a better claim. And Rabbi Yeshua says we don't believe her, generally speaking. But in our Mishnah, Rabbi Yeshua agree, uh, agrees with this, agrees with Rabbi Gamil that we believe a person whose claim on the basis that they could have had a better claim in a situation where a person says, this was really your father's field, but I bought it from your father. And so in that case, we believe him. So the Gemara asked the question, the listening Rabbi Yeshua, but Omer Lechaveros saw the Dushachai Salatach Yamimcha. Why does Rabbi Yeshua, why does the Mishnah have to say that Rabbi Yeshua says we believe him in a case where he says this was your father's field, but I bought it from him? Why doesn't he actually say it in a case where he says this was your field and I bought it from you? Why do we have to say specifically it was your father's field? It seems like we are we're forcing a case, which is not necessary to force. So Gemara you know, explains, the reason why we did that case is only because because we want to have the next case of the Mishnah, where, what does the Mishnah say? The Mishnah had said, if the person, let's say it was Reuben, who says, this was your father's field to Shimon, but I bought it from him, then, then we believe Reuben. But the reason why we use the case of your father's field is because let's say Shimon will respond that this was actually my I actually have witnesses that this was my field and still Ruben says it but I bought it from you but, but Shimon would have his own witnesses to support his claim in that case Ruben is not believed and then Gemara says we're in the middle of 17b and Gemara says hey dummy, what's the scenario where it's possible to say where the Mishnah has to teach us that we wouldn't believe Ruben if Shimon already had witnesses for his claim. What's the scenario? If Ruben had had the field already for three years, we the Gemara tells us, Rabbi Basra, that a person is only required to, to have evidence that he bought the field for three years. After that, if he's living on the field for three straight years, the assumption is that it's his field. So if he if he stayed on the field for three years, then my woman heaven. Well, why wouldn't he be believed? Even if Ruben has witnesses, even if Shimon has witnesses that this was his field, Ruben has a chazaki, has a presumptive status that was his field. And if there were not three years, which he sat in that field and, and assumed ownership of it, she to do him heaven. Well, then it's obvious that in that case, Shimon is not going to be believed. Be, it's obvious in that case that Ruben is not going to be believed because Shimon has witnesses and Ruben doesn't have a presumptive status. So, so if that's the case, so yeah, so if that's the case, that's why we say that this scenario needs to be about Shimon's father and not about Shimon himself. And says, but why? Yachigabi Abav Nami would be the same thing with respect to Shimon's father. If Shimon's father, if Ruben had it for three years, even if Shimon has witnesses that it was his father's. Why wouldn't it be believed? And 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 if Reuben did not have it for three years, Pshita, then it's obvious that Shimon's father would be believed with the witnesses. Mara says, no, Bishlam Gabi Aviv, no, because if it was just a case of Shimon's father, and it's obvious why we would need a case, why we need the Mishnah to teach us this law, because Mishkacha, so we can have such a scenario, where Reuben had the field in his in his possession for two years while Shimon's father was still alive. And one year after Shimon died, while Ruben was the only one alive. Because under those circumstances, excuse me, we could say like Rav Huna's law would come into effect. Dama Rav Huna, what did Rav Huna teach us? That you can't establish a presumptive status about the possessions of a minor, even after the minor grew older, meaning to say that if the minor, if you had it two years while the father was alive, and then one year while the minor was alive, after the father died, that's still not going to establish the chazak against the child, because the child doesn't know enough to make an objection. And so therefore, we're, that's what we're being taught here, that even though 
Shimon has no witnesses, and Reuben had it for three years. Since one of those years was when Shimon himself was a minor, Reuben has not established a presumptive status. And so therefore, under those circumstances, that therefore, under those circumstances, if Shimon has witnesses, those witnesses will override Reuben's presumptive status. Even after the child grows older. And so explains the Gemara, explains the Gemara, Rafuna, so the Gemara says, Rafuna must be sin. So is Rafuna just teaching us what this Mishnah is telling us? Why does Rafuna have to tell us what the Mishnah is saying openly? If the Mishnah says this law openly, why does Rafuna have to tell us this? The Gemara says, well, Ibai is saying, Rafuna, the Yukud must be sin. If you want, you could say, well, Rafuna has to tell us that this is how you have to read the Mishnah. It's not so obvious. Or maybe Ravuna is teaching us the Kiddush that even after the child gets older, if he has one year, so you have two years of a presumptive status of ownership over the land while the father is alive, and then you have a third year after the child gets older, it's still not enough to establish a chazaka. Some say that it means even if the child is three years after they get older, it's still not enough to establish a chazaka because since the child didn't think it was his because it happened long ago, it was a minor. Therefore, you can never establish a chazaka against the field that the child only owned as a minor. Where it says, but let me give you another example. Let's say, going back to the case of Rabbi Yeshua and the Mishnah, say it, 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 it deals with the person himself and not with his father. Okay, go on. Let's see, it deals with where the person established a chazaka of two years while this, while the person was, while Reuven established a chazaka against Shimon's lands for two years while Shimon was in front of him. And one year when Shimon had ran away, it could go in Shabarach, where Shimon ran away, and therefore Reuven wasn't able to establish a chazaka. And that's what it's telling us that those witnesses, that, that under those circumstances where Shimon has witnesses, those witnesses override Ruben's Chazaka. Mara says, well, why? Baruch Machmas, why? Why did he run away? He did Baruch Machmas, the Fresh, as if he ran away because Shimon ran away because his life was in danger. And of course, Ruben is not going to be believed in that case. Because Shimon was not going to be able to object. He did Baruch. Excuse me. And if Shimon ran away just because he was trying for monetary reasons, he had to run away. That's not an excuse. He still should have objected. Because we have a, we have a principle that if you object and you're not in the presence, that, that, that even though you're not living in the same place as this person, it would still be an objection. So therefore, Shimon should have objected if he ran away for monetary purposes. The Tanan, as we learned in the Mishnah in Babak Basra, Shalosh Artzot Chazaka. There are three lands as it as it relates to a presumptive status. Chuda, Yehuda is one land, meaning to say that you have to you have to make a claim that this is my land, or else the other person establishes the presumptive status. And the three lands are Judah, Eber Yarden, the Galil, and the Galil. Hayy the Yehuda. Let's say the person is in Judah, the Hill, seek the Galil. And the original owner, and the person uh, takes his land, and he's in the Galilee, or the Galil, the hills of Yehuda, or one is in Galilee and the other one in Judah, ain't a chazaka, then it's not considered that you've established a presumptive status. Actually, yeah, imo bimedina, you have to be in the same country. Ravina, and we explained that Mishnah in Baba Basra, my kosavar. What is our mission of opinion? If you're going to, if you're going to say, that if you make an objection and you're not in his presence, that's considered still an objection. And even if one's in Judah and the other's in Galilee, you should still have to object. And if you're going to say that's not considered an objection if you're not in his presence, and I feel you would be not know, even if you're in two different cities in Judah, it's also not considered an objection. No, really, you're saying. We're saying that if you have an objection and you're not in his presence, that is an objection. But our mission is talking about a time of persecution. And there, during a time of persecution, you're not able to get the word out. And so therefore, if you're in a different province from Judah to Galilee, that's not going to be considered an objection. And therefore, the other person can't establish a presumptive status. Well, if this refers to all times of persecution, why does the mission specify specifically Judah and Galilee? So it's teaching us on top of 18a 
the Stam Yehuda the Golil Bishas Leirim Dami. That that Yehuda and Golil is a paradigm of something that's always considered a Shas Leirim. It's always considered a time of persecution because it's always hard to get the word out from one place to the other. There's always something going on there. There's there's not a lot of caravans going back from Judah to Galilee, so it's always considered like a Shas Leirim. And an objection from there will never be considered an objection. So if one owner owns the land in Judah. And the other one's a galley, you can't assume that you've established a presumptive status while the while the person who has the claim is in the galley. So the Gemara says, and we'll give you another case which our Mishnah could have said, which is simpler than saying it's about his father. Why don't we say, why don't we say the following case that Rabbi Yeshua himself would admit that if one person says to his friend, I lent, I borrowed a money, I borrowed a hundred dollars from you, and I paid it to you. That he's believed. Why do we have to say it about real estate? Why don't we say that he said this case just about a loan? Why do, why do we have to say it's about real estate? Why don't we say that the case is about the loan? So the Gemara explains the reason why we say it's about real estate and not about a loan is because Misham the Kabbalah and Misnei Seifa because we want to say the next cause. What's the next cause of our our Mishnah? Because how would the how would the parallel case work out if we apply it to a loan? We're saying Yemiyesh Adam should love him, Emmanuel. If there were witnesses that he borrowed the money, the one more parative ain't on them. If there were, we had memory, we said if there were witnesses that it was his real estate and 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 that the real estate belonged to him, his father, then then the person who makes the admission is not believed. But in this case, if there were witnesses that he, that he borrowed the money, but he's but Ruben says, but yeah, but I paid it. You can't say ain't on them. Because we have the principle that he is believed. When somebody lends somebody else with, with only with witnesses and now with a contract, you don't need to pay him back with witnesses. And so therefore, he will be believed if he just says, yes, you lent me the money without witnesses, but I paid you back, but I paid you back. Then the person who says, but I paid you back would be believed. And so therefore, the mission doesn't teach that case. The Lord says, well, listening, Moda Rabbi Yoshua, but why don't we say, we should say the following, that Yeshua admits, but Omer Lechavero Mano Avi Why don't we say that Rabbi Yeshua admits in the case where a person says, your father, I owed your father $100, but I, but I consumed half of it, so I only owe you 50. Why wouldn't we say in that case, Shu Neman? Why wouldn't we say in that case that Reuven is believed to say that he owes 50? Mar says, Aliba Deman, according to whom? According to whom do you want to say th- this this scenario? Yaliba, the Rabbanan. So the Gemara is going to say that this is a dispute between the Rabbanan, Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, and Meseches Shavuot. And the dispute relates to a concept where 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 you make such a claim. And we'll see the the, Mish- the Gemara is going to say a bride where we'll say it fully, and so then we'll explain it. The Gemara says Yaliba, the Rabbanan. If you want to say it, it's according to the rabbis, Ha Amri Meishan Aveda Havi. The rabbis would say in that case if you if you initiated the claim, nobody made the claim against you, but you said, actually, this was my father's, uh, this was your father's, and I ate half of it. The rabbis would say under those cases, like you found the lost object and you're returning it. And the rabbis would say, you're exempt. It's like you found the lost object and you're returning it. And the Gemara Masech HaSkitin tells us, if you find the lost object, I find your wallet on the street and I'm returning to you the hundred dollars I found in it. You don't have to swear that there wasn't two hundred dollars on it, because then nobody would want to return the lost objects in the first place. The Ik Rebbe Lazar ben Yaakov, and if you want to say it follows the position of Rebbe Lazar ben Yaakov, Ha Amar Shmuel by Rebbe Lazar ben Yaakov would say under this scenario where you where you say this was your father's, your father gave me a loan and I and I ate half of it, that you would have to take an oath. Where do we see that? The Tanya Rebbe Lazar ben Yaakov Omer Pa'amam Shadam Nishbal Tanas Asma. Rebbe Lazar ben Yaakov says there are even some times where you make the initial claim and yet you still have to take an oath. Kate said, how so? Do you say your father left, lent me $100, but I ate half of it? Then he has to take an oath. And that's a scenario where he has to make an, take an oath on the basis of his own admission, his own claim to begin with. Since you initiated the claim there, it's like you're returning a lost object, and so therefore you're exempt. So the Gemara says, wait, in this case of where it's just like you're returning the last object, would Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov really say that you have to take an oath? You initiated the, the, the admission. Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov, it's like Mishan Avayda Upatha, Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov really doesn't accept this principle that it's like you're returning the last object and you're exempt. So I'm a Rav, so Rav says, and, and 
this is a case which we which we had already uh, recently. For Rav said, no, it's beton no katan. The reason why it's not really where you're admitting it on your own; it's where a minor made the claim against you. The Gemara says, what, what are you talking about? That the minor made against you, claim against you. Rabbi and Yaakov would say you have to take an oath. But we have a principle. You don't have to take an oath if the a claim was initially aided against you by my defute, a minor, or insane. The Gemara says, my cotton, no, when it says a minor initiated claim against you, it's really not a minor, it's a goggle, it's an adult. So my carly cotton, so why is he called a minor? Because vis a vis his father's his father's estate, he's called a minor. And the Gemara says, he achi. If that's the case, Tanis Atma, why is it called the claim of him, his own claim, Tanis Acherimhi? That, that's not a person making his own claim, which the rabbis say it's like you're returning lost object. This was the claim of other people. The Mara says, Tanis Acherim Rodas Atma. No, other people made the claim, but he made the admission. The Mara says, Well, Kui Tanasa, that's every single claim is Tanis Acherim Rodas Atma. Every single claim is other people making the claim, and he himself makes the admission. So what's the reason why it doesn't make sense? So what's the reason why the Rabbanon say in this case you're exempt? And Rabbi Lezer and Yaakov says you have to take an oath. So the Gemara says, okay, they're they're relating to a different dispute. They're arguing about something that Rabbah said. That Rabbah said a fundamental principle throughout the Talmud, very, very important principle that, that Rabbah taught us throughout the Talmud. This is the principle called modib and mixus, that if you have a partial admission that you have to, that you are liable to take an oath. If you were called for a call, if you completely denied somebody else's claim, then we're going to say you're exempt from having to take an oath. But if it is a partial admission, then we're going to say that you're so arrogant that, that the reason why you're making a partial admission is because you're afraid to completely completely lie to the other person. And so that's what we're going to say. It says, Why did the Torah say, that if you have a partial admission to a claim, you have to take an oath, because chazaka, because there's a presumptive status, in other may is pun of the Nebuchadnezzar because the person is not going to be so arrogant as to completely deny the other person's claim. Really, he wants to deny everything. And the reason why he doesn't reject everything is in other may is pun of because the person is not going to be so arrogant as to completely deny the other person's claim. On top of 18b, and really, he, he, he really owes everything to the person. But the reason why he didn't admit it is he wants to push him off. The uh, And he says, until I have the money, then I'll pay him back. He says, until I have the money, I'll pay him back. So therefore, that's the principle of Moda B'mitzas. That's the principle of a partial admission. So, make him take an oath so that he'll have to pay you so, so, so we'll admit to everything. So that's the fundamental principle of modib emitzas of a partial admission. And so, why in this case the Rebbe Lezer and Yaakov and and the Rabbanon argue? So the partial admission, everybody says, if you make a, if someone makes a claim against you and you make a partial admission, you have to take an oath. You have to take an oath that you that you actually don't owe all the money. But in this case, we're talking about a case where a child makes a claim about his father's estate, that you owe his father, you owed his father a hundred dollars. So here, do, do you have the principle that you're not going to be so disrespectful and, and completely lie to, uh, and completely reject the claim that you owe somebody money when they lend you money. Rebbe and Yaakov Savar, Rebbe it doesn't matter who lent you the money in the first place, his father or you, you're never going to be so arrogant as to reject it. You won't be so arrogant as to completely reject it. It's not going to be the same principle of like you're returning a lost object. The Rabbanan Savi, Rabbanan say, no, the principle of Lodim Mitzvah doesn't apply here. Who they know may use. But yeah, if it was if the person who lent him the money, you're not going to be so arrogant as to reject it. But with respect to his son, he would reject it. We do low is, and for the fact that he doesn't reject it completely, it's like he's found the lost object which he's returning. And that's the principle of, therefore, the principle of motive mixed us doesn't apply. And that's why the Rabbanon say it's Meshima Veda and he doesn't have to take an oath under, under these circumstances. And so now we are up to the next Mishnah on Yudches Amud Beis. So it says the Mishnah, Ha'edim Shamru, let's say the witnesses come along and they say, Ha'edim Shamru, Ksav Yodeinu, who's this? Yes, we admit that this is our signature. Yes, we signed this document. 
we sign this document, but what when we do so, we're telling you that why do we sign it? We were under duress. We didn't really want to sign it. They forced us to sign it. It's not true what's in this document. Or they say, you know, we were minors and therefore we weren't kosher to sign it. Or they say, you know, you were disqualified witnesses. Again, we we're not kosher to sign this document. We're going to believe these people, their testimony, because what's the reasoning Rashi explained? Because it's the same principle of Pesha Asura Pesha Hitcher. They're the ones who, who are telling us that this is their signature. We would have no way of knowing that this was their signature without them supporting this idea. So they're the ones who told us that this is their signature. So this is the same principle of a Pesha Asur Pesha Hitir. Because just like we believe them, it's their signature, we're going to believe them that that what they testified to was was not was not kosher. So therefore, if there were witnesses that this was their signature, if there are other witnesses that this was their signature, or if they can verify this was their signature by comparing it to other signatures that they have on record, we're not going to believe them when they say our testimony was done under duress or false, or we were ch- children, or we were disqualified. So I'm a rabbi When do we say, when do we say, Roshanu Rashi says, when do we say we don't believe them? If their signatures can be verified from another place, that we don't believe them, only where they say we were under duress as a result of money meaning to say that we took, basically, we, we took a bribe to sign this document. But if they say we signed this document, because otherwise we would have been killed, meaning to say, yes, you could prove the signatures without us, but we had no choice when we had to sign it because otherwise we would have been killed. We're going to believe them under these circumstances. So meaning to say, we believe they're we believe they're almost like they're testifying. Yes, why did they sign this document? Because we had to sign it under duress of being killed. Amrle Rava Kol Kamine Rava says we can't accept this. We have a principle. What's the principle? Kivin Shehiga Chuv Eino Chozer Magid. This is like a second testimony. We have a principle. Once you testified about one thing. You, you're not allowed to come back and testify against that thing that you said. Once you testify, your testif- testimony is sealed. You're done. You can't come back and recant your testimony. It's not going to be acceptable. So, and if you want to say, no, when do we say, when do we say this principle that once you testify, you can't, you don't get a second chance to testify? That's only if you testify orally. If you do by a contract, you can do it. If you have witnesses that are signed on a contract, that witnesses who are signed on a contract, it's like they, they were cross-examined. So whether you're orally or written, we're going to say once you testify, you can't change the testimony. So the statement of Rami Baruch what was it taught about? It was taught about the first clause of our Mishnah. How so? This is what it means. It says in the first clause of our Mishnah, if two witnesses come and say that that's our testimony, but we signed it under duress, they're believed. And about that, Rami Bukhama says, When do we believe them? Only if they say we signed it because otherwise we're going to be killed. But if they said we signed it because otherwise uh, we had to take the money from them, we were being bribed or whatever. If at a monetary reason, we're not going to believe them. My time Russia. Because we're not going to allow a person to make themselves into a wicked person. Uh, kind of like the Fifth Amendment. You can't not it's not against self-incrimination. Rashi says. <laughs> a person is not believed to impugn his own presumptive status of being okay. To carve who ate, excuse me. Because we're going to say to carve away to Asmo, he's a relative of himself. The carve Pasola and, and a relative is not able to disqualify his own testimony. And so, therefore, for this reason, 
is not able to impugn his own testimony. And by him saying, I was a wicked person, I took this, I took this uh, bribe, he's impugning himself. And so therefore, that's the principle. So uh, that in other masonats more Russia. So that's what Rami Barakama is saying. Yeah, we believe you if you're going to say you were an ones from from your wife. But if you were going to say you did it for money, we're not going to believe you. And so therefore, your testimony is accepted because you val validated your signature, and we don't believe you that you did it under duress. So 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 we learn in the Brahma, so the Brahma says we don't believe him to it disqualify himself. According to Rabbi Mayer, whereas the Chachamim say we do believe him. We'll pick this up, God willing, tonight. We'll stop here. We'll pick this up, God willing, tonight at 7 20 p.m. and we'll continue. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to address the questions about this beautiful.